Hello, and thank you for joining the Agile Technology Cell Analysis webinar series. Our talk for today is entitled, How Intracellular Metabolic Change Governs Immunity and Inflammation. My name is David Farrick, and I am the Associate Vice President of Cell Analysis for Agile Technologies. I'll be your host uh, today for this webinar. Agilent's broad position in the life sciences includes clinical research, diagnostics, and applied chemical markets. With our many platform solutions and expertise, we strive to enable our customers to gain the insights they seek. Uh, I'm excited today to introduce our speaker, who will be Luke O'Neill, who's Professor, Chair of Biochemistry at Trinity College in uh, Dublin. Um, this is uh, Luke's actually second appearance here, so we're extremely happy to have him back. As you, many of you know, he's been a great pioneer uh, in the field of immunometabolism. Uh, we've learned so much so quickly uh, in the last uh, five or 10 years about how metabolic programs can really drive the physical activity of cells and really propel them in directions where we can actually anticipate outcomes. And that's what's created all this excitement, especially now with the advent of immunotherapy and targeting our most native and natural system with which to protect ourselves. And so uh, with that, um, I will, before I hand the mic over to uh, Luke, I'd like to remind you that this webinar is interactive in the sense that you can ask a question anytime during Luke's presentation. And it's very helpful for you to do that. So at the end, when we have our live Q&A session, we can get to as many of your questions as possible. Uh, so with that, I'm very happy to hand it over to you, Luke. Great. Thanks so much, David. I'm very happy to take part today. Thanks, Adjutant, for uh, inviting me. I'm always happy to talk. Uh, we're living in a new world. I guess everybody listening in is the same as me, in a sense. Now, my lab has managed to reopen, which is good. We're working on COVID-19. I'll mention that as we go through. So we're kind of back to normal. But it's obviously a very challenging time for everybody. So I hope you're all comfortable in your houses with your cups of coffee in front of you. And I'm going to give you a, a couple of research stories, I guess. Uh, one has been published already. And one is a work in progress, which, which might interest you. And I'm going to cover, of course, this area. As David said, the area of metabolic change has really undergone a, a renaissance, you might say, in the past 10 years or so, with many interesting papers coming out and many new insights into how metabolic change then affects immunity and inflammation. My main interest is the inflammatory process, and I've worked on that, I guess, for 30 years or so. It's very relevant at the moment, of course, because of COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 causing inflammation and many of the problems with that disease are inflammatory related. So it's very much in fashion, I guess. And I've noticed many people now know what a cytokine is. I don't know if it's the same wherever you guys are, but they've heard of these things and they're always asking about them. And suddenly now we're all sort of in vogue as immunologists, which is a nice thing. I guess it's an opportunity to educate people in terms of what we're doing. Now, I thought I might take off with a bit of general background. And uh, the, the next slide, I've got this kind of concept, which several of us have been sort of had on the horizon for a while now, I guess. And if you're a physician, you know that diseases like rheumatoid arthritis or inflammatory bowel disease or MS, or three I list here, you get to a certain uh, efficacy seeding with the current therapy. And it's quite hard to go above that efficacy seeding. Some patients respond well, some not so well, some stop responding. The current therapies are useful, of course, but they don't really crack these diseases. And the next slide shows you this, um, some of the things we're targeting here. And the ones that get to, say, 50%, I'm just picking that number kind of semi-randomly, I guess, but you get to a certain seeding of efficacy. And these are things that like block cytokines, block T cells, block B cells. These will work to a certain extent, but can we go above this? And can we get this even better than that, than that efficacy seeding? And, of course, the things that we're very interested in there are different things. And this is where metabolism fits in, because these recent discoveries have suggested very specific metabolic change will govern. The inflammatory process. I've got two other things listed here. The stroma are very interesting. Uh, there's more and more discoveries there on subtypes of fibroblasts. And of course, they've got very interesting metabolic profiles as well. Any stromal cell will have a role, and that will be slightly different from the immune target. And then NLRP3, the inflammasome. And I mentioned that because that's been a big area for my lab. And in fact, my lab got into immunometabolism from our work in NLRP3, and I want to give you a little bit on that as we go through. So basically, the idea here is these are newer things that you might think about targeting to increase efficacy in terms of therapies. And you might combine them now with some of the immune targets. And maybe on their own, they might be highly efficacious and reprogram the inflammatory process. And that's kind of the overarching idea that many labs are working on. And these recent discoveries will support that notion. 
And the two I'm going to focus about today, I'll focus on today, are NLRP3 and especially uh, uh, metabolism. And let me begin with NLRP3. This, in many ways, is a sensor a metabolic disturbance. And I'm sure many of you have heard of it, if not worked on it. And it was first found by Jörg Chop. He sadly passed away, of course. And we always remember Jörg because he was the pioneering investigator. It's in macrophages. It senses various disturbances. And these are often metabolic disturbances. And then drives IL-1 production, the cytokine IL-1. It also drives IL-18 and a type of cell death called pyroptosis. So all three of those are being driven by this sensor. And here we see in yellow, cholesterol crystals are sensed, amyloid factors, you see those in type 2 diabetes, uh, uric acid crystals down the bottom there, they can be detected as well, beta amyloid and Alzheimer's, alpha synuclein and Parkinson's, they're protein up at the, for protein deposition as a feature. So it's almost as if NLRP3 evolved partly to sense a metabolic imbalance of some kind. And of course, we still don't know what causes many of these imbalances, uh, there's some uh, information on cholesterol, I guess. But overall, what causes that disturbance isn't really clear. But we do know the macrophage can sense these metabolites and then drive inflammation. The goal being to clear these noxious things. And of course, as well as that, it senses various microbial factors too. So NLRP3 emerges as a very important sensor of a kind of a disturbance, if you like, and metabolic disturbance is a key part of that. And really, this next slide now, for me, kind of summarizes, I guess, 25 years of studies in a way, in that we now think there are four main pathways, at least in my opinion, that drive the whole inflammatory process. And all this fantastic research has happened. Many labs all over the world have revealed the importance of these four pathways. So on the left, you've got the jack stat pathway, the cytokines drive. And then we have the C-gas thing pathway, that senses DNA in the wrong place. That will drive, say, type 1 interferons and drive autoimmunity. Then we've had LRP3 sensing noxious things, and that will drive, as I say, IL-1, IL-18, and pyroptosis. And then finally, the TNF pathway is one example. RIP kinases are very interesting as well, and that will drive cell death. And these end up driving inflammation and autoimmunity. So therefore, we think now that we're pretty close to a good understanding of these major pathways. Uh, we know this is potentially true because of the inhibitors. And there are jack inhibitors on the market already that block the jack pathway. Many companies are developing C-gas inhibitors to block DNA driving autoimmunity. Many are developing NLRP3 inhibitors that will block, you know, all these noxious stimuli driving autoinflammation. And real kinase inhibitors are also in development. Some of these are, are early stage programs, I guess. The JAK inhibitors are the most advanced. And we'll see now if this actually turns out to be useful in the clinic. And of course, many of us believe it will be. And then our own um, discovery back in 2015, we had a paper on NLRP3 inhibitors a drug called MCC950, there was a postdoc in my lab, Rebecca Call with a paper in Nature Medicine on this, and, and this is a very specific NLRP3 inhibitor. And strikingly, it's working in 53 separate models of inflammation. Now, can you really believe that a single small molecule having all these effects in, in these different models? And we're talking about in the CNS, models of Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, um, atherosclerosis for coronary artery disease, certain autoimmune models, with rare diseases, caps as a mutation, and then LRP3 where we see efficacy, and then certain infections. And who knows, maybe COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2, because we know IL-1 is in that disease, it's driving IL-6, which is an important cytokine for COVID-19. And in a way, what, what the inhibitors would do there is they're limiting the you know, septic inflammatory consequences of infection. So, I mean, can it really be true? At this point, I say, can it be true a single anti-inflammatory can work in all these different contexts? And of course, that does seem to be the case. And it places NLRP3, as a really important driver of inflammation, sensing all this disturbance. And the disturbance is often driven by an imbalance in metabolism. And remember, your chap's original paper in the NLRP3 knockout, he got insulin hypersensitivity. Those mice were hypersensitive to insulin. And what we think is happening there is NLRP3 is limiting insulin because the inflammatory process will cause insulin resistance. And NLRP3 seems to be a part of that. So again, the world of NLRP3 is very much part of the immunometabolic world. Now, the next slide brings it even closer to metabolism because three of these four pathways, the C-gas pathway, NLRP3, and the RIPK pathway, all are involved in mitochondrial sensing. And mitochondrial dysfunction will link into those pathways. Mitochondrial DNA will be an agonist for C-gas. It can also get sensed to NLRP3. Things like ROS are coming out of mitochondria to modulate the RIPK pathway, for instance. So suddenly, mitochondrial aberration, if you will, is a driver 
of these various inflammatory pathways. And of course, we knew for a long time that mitochondria were tied into the inflammatory process in various ways. And in the last sort of five or six years, I guess, some of the mechanistic links from the mitochondria to these downstream pathways have become all the more clear. And therefore, mitochondria get our attention in, in more and more detail. And, and really, the next slide shows you the kind of overarching principle here that what's really happening is a metabolic reprogramming event. That's being driven by inflammatory stimuli or by noxious metabolites or whatever it might be. You get metabolic change inside the cells, and this could be a T cell or a macrophage, and that metabolic reprogramming alters the phenotype of the cell. So now we get a change in gene expression that's inflammatory, and that might promote disease. And that's a kind of new thing, and David did um, refer to this in a way. So metabolism went from just being to do with, say, biosynthesis or bioenergetics. It's now seen, at least in this context, as a driver of the phenotype of the cell. And how if you measure this metabolic change, you can predict the phenotype of the cell and then maybe alter it by targeting that metabolic change. And that's the kind of overarching concept that's emerged most recently. And one really good example of this is in the next couple of slides. So Nav Chandel, who many would have heard of, he's a real pioneering mitochondrial investigator, has a great book called Navigating Metabolism. And I'd recommend it to people who want to get, get up to speed. It's a really good sort of a pretty short-ish account of metabolic pathways and their relevance. In that book, Nav, towards the end, gets various experts to give their opinion on metabolism and where that might be going as an area. And Nav himself, and this is a quote from, from, from his own book, he says, metabolism is the driver and genes are the passenger. Now, isn't that an amazing statement? We all think genes are so important, of course. Um, I'm not downplaying the role of genetics and analysis of different genetic variants and disease, but Nav says metabolism is driving that change in a way. And part of his reason is um, variants in genes can't explain the increased incidence of the diseases we're talking about. So the increase in asthma allergy, many inflammatory diseases have gone up in incidence. It's too fast to be explained by a genetic change, is what he says. What has changed is our diet, the environment, and behavior. And guess what? Metabolism is sensing those things. It's poised to detect those changes and then change gene expression and cause disease. And of course, understanding this then might provide new targets. And of course, a major reason for this is epigenetics. And this is very important because we think one way that metabolic change ties into a gene expression change is through the epigenome. And acetyl-CoA, acetylation, alpha-KG is a cofactor for demethylases that might affect histones or DNA. Succinate can block them. Now, there's a very important finding. There's two Krebs cycle intermediates directly controlling DNA methylation status and histone methylation status through the role of these two cofactors. And then thirdly, carbon-1 metabolism is needed for methylation reactions. And of course, that brings you into, you know, on the thionine and the whole area of folate and how carbon-1 then controls methylation states of DNA and histones. And that's why we think metabolism connects into the epigenetic change and maybe changes in metabolites then could impact on the epigenome and that will then give rise to disease. And that's the kind of an area that's still very much being explored. And that's why now I would say metabolism is the driver and genes as a passenger, because it's the metabolic, metabolic change is driving a gene expression change. That's a, and that's a very important kind of concept for us to consider. Now, let me now get in a bit more detail. So, so the other thing to say is we do think that uh, this metabolic shift, complex though it might be, can be kind of summed up in one word. That's Warburg metabolism. That was first seen in tumors by Arnold Warburg, of course. And the same seems to be happening in inflammation. And what it means is a change in glycolysis, and it's aerobic glycolysis is how Warburg defined it, I'm inclined to use the word aberrant because you get strange alterations in glycolysis with roles for glycolytic enzymes in various contexts. And then secondly, and very importantly, mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's as important as the change in glycolysis. So both of these are driving then this inflammatory process. And it, it, it ties into the original Warburg effect. And that's a very important kind of idea. And also then an interesting finding which I'm highlighting recently is how mitochondria again are so important for Warburg. And then secondly, mitochondria are now a very important organelle. And this diagram here shows you uh, how publications have changed. And look at this, beginning in about 2010, papers on mitochondria began to overtake the nucleus. So suddenly mitochondria is much more prominent as an area, and we think that's because of immunometabolism. That immune, immunologists began to look at the mitochondria and publish on them more and more. The nucleus falls behind. Look where poor old Golgi is. If you work on the Golgi, you're a loser. Look at that. Atrocious. So work on mitochondria because it's very exciting. 
And all these insights are giving us, you know, massive new things to think about in terms of therapeutic options and how the mitochondria might be working in the context of, of an inflammatory process. Now, let, and, and there's a great phrase I've used, metabolism from genetics. Now, I'm not knocking genetics, it's extremely important, of course it is. And it's the interplay between the two that really counts, I suppose, ultimately. But remember, metabolic change is as important as any genetic alteration you might detect. Now, let me get down to some nitty gritties. I'm going to give you two examples from my own lab. And, and as I say, one's been published. The first is on PKM2. It's very important in enzyme glycolysis. And we've got a key role for PKM2 in inflammatory macrophage activation, and then more recently in TA17 activation. I'm going to give you that story. And the second story is all about succinate and idoconase, two very important Krebs cycle intermediates. And we've been publishing on this in the past couple of years. And I'm going to give you a new story on idoconase that I think is very important. And it brings you back to NLRP3, as you'll see when we get to that part of the talk. So they're my two kind of research-based stories I'm going to give you today. Now, first of all, PKM2, it is a fascinating enzyme. It's the last enzyme in glycolysis. It converts PEP to pyruvate, which you'll all be familiar with. That's the tetrameric form of the enzyme. A lot of work's been into this over the past 20, 30 years. So the tetramer drives glycolysis. Sometimes it's a dimer, and it seems to oscillate between the dimeric form and a tetrameric form, and various cofactors can affect this. SACAR is one famous one that drives the tetramer, for instance. Uh, fructose bisphosphate will drive the tetramer, and that will promote glycolysis because that's a feed-forward loop. But the dimer turns out to have a different function. And that, again, we've shown people like Matt van der Heiden in various labs had shown this. It goes to the nucleus, incredibly. Non-enzymatic function control gene expression. And that's a separate function. We call this moonlighting is a word that's sometimes used. It's a different job from the main job of this enzyme. And so, therefore, this suddenly becomes a very interesting biochemical phenomenon. Uh, the role in the nucleus seems to be as a cofactor for transcription. And as you see, HIF. One alpha is a very important part of this. And my lab in 2016 then could show the dimeric form was pro-inflammatory, as we'll see in a minute. The testimony was anti-inflammatory. So suddenly an enzyme in glycolysis, that, that was a key enzyme for that process, had a role in the inflammatory process based on its oligomeric state. And we had a paper on this in 2016. And that paper showed the following data, where the dimeric form in macrophages, now our main model system is LPS, driving macrophage activation, like a generic inflammatory stimulus. The dimer goes to the nucleus, after LPS, interacts with HIF, and HIF is a very important cofactor. This was first shown by Greg Cement, actually. And this happens in tumors as well, by the way. And we can show the same thing in macrophages. And guess what? IL-1 is a HIF-dependent gene. Not only that, but all of other enzymes in glycolysis are HIF-dependent. So you're boosting the Warburg effect through this process by inducing many of these enzymes in glycolysis. And very importantly, there's a small molecule that can stop that and form a tetramer. And that was first developed for tumors by the NCI, because again, dimetic PCM2 is a feature of tumors. And we could show those molecules could block IL-1. They were anti-inflammatory because they were forcing this tetramer. And there was no longer a dimer to interact with HIF to drive IL-1 gene expression. And these small molecules are very interesting because they're a prospect now as a therapeutic. And what we also saw that's important is if you go in vivo, and we often go in vivo because when you're in vitro and you've got cells in culture, the medium is very defined and some of the metabolites are not necessarily what you would normally see. So, so we like to see uh, uh, more evidence for our overall conclusion in the in vivo situation. And this is giving mice LPS. They make loads of IL-1, you'll see on the left there. Give them this tetramerizer called TEP46 and look what happens. They make a lot less IL-1. And on the right, they make more IL-10. So here we have a shift in the phenotype of the macrophage away from IL-1 towards IL-10 by driving tetramatic PKM2. And that really illustrates how important the oligomeric state of this enzyme is. And that we probably said, as I say, about four years ago now. And then more recently, we, we wondered about T cells. And a postdoc came to my lab from Verona, Stefano Angari. He always says I don't pronounce his name right. I did my best there, Stefano, if you're listening in. Uh, anyway, he was a T cell biologist. He worked on AMS and all the T cells. And he said to me, let's work on PKM2 and T cells. And strangely, it had been neglected. There was a couple of papers historically, but not much was known about the role of PKM2 and T cells. So of course, we began to work on this. And first of all, we could show very strong PKM2 activation after T cell stimulation with MCD3 and C28. Here we see PKM2 being phosphorylated, a marker of activation on serine 37 on the left. 
On the right, it goes to the nucleus. Look at this, by 48 hours, this patient has all gone to the nucleus after T-cell activation. So this suggested a role for PKM2, just like in the macrophage, in driving T-cell activation. And then, of course, we got our inhibitor, our tetramonizer, gave that to T-cells, and look what happened. It was especially good at blocking TH17. And here we see TH17 differentiation by fax profile. You see for 28% going down to 8%. If you tetramerize PKM2, there's the levels of IL-17 being suppressed in the histogram. Various transcription factors are also in the bizarre houses blocked there, for instance, in that panel. So it seemed as if PKM2 was especially relevant for TH17 cells. It was also important for TH1 cells. And here we see inhibition of interferon gamma production. If you tetramerize PKM2, who would have thought that would be a factor in T cells? And it is. Here we see in the fast profile of an inhibition of um, interferon gamma production, and there's the quantification. EOMIS was the transcription factor that stood out there and was being inhibited. So suddenly there was a role now for dimeric PKM2 in inflammatory T cell activation. And then even more interestingly, the T cells began to look more like T regs. And as many will know, T regs are anti inflammatory. And here we see increased FOX P3 if you test summarized PKM2 in the top panel. Middle panel in TA17, polarizing conditions. Again, we got a boost in uh, FOX P3. And then TA21, again, there was a boost in FOX P3. So again, it seems as if PKM2 was governing the phenotype of the T cell. And then the various downstream things that PKM2 regulates CMIC is downstream, mTOR is downstream, and HIF, as I mentioned. And all three of these are inhibited if you tetramerize PKM2. You can see on the, on the, on the left, MIC is being suppressed. This in the middle, and now mTOR on the right. All of those are blocked if you tetramerize PKM2. And we did a big RNA-seq analysis of gene expression in T cells. Green means inhibited. And you can see here, whole sets of mix-dependent genes are blocked by the tetramerizer. Whole sets of HIF-1-alpha-dependent genes are blocked as well. And some of the mTOR-dependent genes are blocked. So all these downstream consequences are being inhibited. And here we have seahorse. I don't know wondering when I'm going to mention it. Of course, we did have lots of seahorse analysis here, and we used seahorse to measure glycolytic rate here. That was suppressed by the tetramerizer, and the capacity was also blocked. And again, the reason for this, we think, is suppressing HIF-dependent genes, and some of those are in glycolysis. And on the very right-hand side, then, many of the genes that are HIF-dependent, and the green means down, and they're being repressed by the tetramerizer, and that's why you're blocking the rate and the capacity in terms of glycolysis in T cells if you tetramerize PKM2. And then we um, we also, uh, that's, more, that's the same data again. I see there's um, TOR being inhibited again, just in, in, in particular. And then there's my, again, my seahorse profile there where e is being measured. And there we see the tetramerides are very clearly blocking that. Same data on the last slide, just, just to take that data out for this particular talk. So again, we're blocking glycolysis effectively and the seahorse reveal that result for us, which is very neat. And then we go in vivo. Again, I've mentioned in vivo before. And um, here's a model of, uh, autoimmunity is EAE. Many are familiar with this. It's a demyelination model. It's very much TH17 dependent. We gave the mice to from ours, and look what happened. Delayed onset of demyelination in those mice. You can see on the left hand side, didn't lose weight in the middle there, and there's the quantification. So, again, an anti inflammatory effect in a, a TH17 dependent model in vivo with a molecule that, remember, forces tetramerization of TKM2. And then we also did an ex vivo challenge because, of course, the macrophages and dendritic cells would also have this phenomenon. They could be the reason for the anti-inflammatory effect. So we took out T-cells from the mice, gave them TEP46 to tetramerize all the PKM2, put them back in, and lo and behold, they are protective. And here we see suppression of the AE again by transferring in those T-cells into the mice, and the weight loss is also blocked if you have these, these T-cells that have been TEP46 treated. So that gave us even more confidence that this is a very important event. To suppress inflammation. And what this means then is this moonlighting role, this dimeric role, because remember all that data I showed you was a small molecule forcing the tetramer, which was inhibitory. The dimer is needed for these inflammatory events. And it's not just in macrophages, it's also in T cells, is the important thing. And I kind of show this as a way, because we know metabolism is intensely complex. PKM2 is a primacy, we think, at least in these studies. The dimer is driving HIFs driving mTOR and driving CMIT. And there's also other people, thankfully, have got the same data. Two more papers came out. I mentioned one by Claudio Murray from Birmingham. He links the dimer to stacks in T-cells. 
and there's knockdown data as well, not just small molecule data. So several labs now have confirmed the central role for this dimer in driving these inflammatory events. And of course, the, the, the very important is the phenotypic change. And this slide captures that. Now, remember, I told you already about the macrophage. So you need dimeric PKM2 to drive inflammatory macrophages. If you force the tetramer, you get an anti-inflammatory macrophage. Equally now with T cells, you'll push things towards T regs if you give them TEP46, the tetramerizer, and you'll suppress TA17 development. And it turns out many metabolic inhibitors can do this. 2-deoxyglucose, rapamycin, dimethyl fumarate, which of course is used to treat MS. DFMR was a polyamine synthesis inhibitor, and DJ Kushia with some very nice data on polyamine metabolism being required for TA17 differentiation. So if you block any of those, the T cell becomes more T reg like. And that's compelling, we think, because here we have a metabolic process which is driving the phenotype of the T cell, which you can target with small molecules. And of course, you can see therapeutic potential in this because the inflammatory stimulus might still be there, but now we're getting a T reg population instead of a TA17 by, say, tetramerizing PKM2. And that's the therapeutic angle that might emerge from all this work. Now, my second topic then is uh, the two Krebs cycle metabolites. My lab has worked on Krebs cycle and its role in, in metabolism macrophages for quite a few years now. And we had a paper in 2013 on succinate coming off Krebs as a key inflammatory signal. And then more recently, itaconate, another Krebs derived metabolite. Just, I'm going to mainly talk about itaconate in this talk today. And remember, remind you what Krebs is. There is the famous Krebs cycle, it is the central metabolic hub. Uh, you would all have learned it, and we all know about electron transport, and then the H of the H2 coming off Krebs, driving electrons through the ETC to drive ATP production. That was its traditional role. But remember, you can make amino acids from Krebs for protein synthesis. You can make purines and pyrimidines for nucleotide synthesis, and lipids from citrate, of course, for membranes. So it is the central hub of all metabolism. So in some ways, it was not much of a surprise when we got to see changes in Krebs in macrophage activation and some of these metabolites then having interesting properties. And that's been a focus for my lab for the past, I guess, six, seven, eight years now. And remember, this might be the way we all remember Krebs. Learn the Krebs cycle, forget the Krebs cycle, repeat. You all can identify with that, can't you? So it's been a challenge for students for many years. Uh, and we see it as a textbook thing, don't we? And yet these latest discoveries make Krebs really interesting. Or, well, I use the phrase, why not? We've made Krebs great again because of all these recent findings to do with the immune system. And the two I want to hone in on now are succinate and itaconate. Now, succinate is in Krebs, and as I've said before, it's got a key inflammatory role. Itaconate is different. It's coming off Krebs. And the enzyme IRG1, also called CAD, this is kind of take decarboxylase, takes the conotate from Krebs and makes itaconate. And that's what I'm going to talk about, that diversion. And I think in many ways, this is the best example we have of a metabolic reprogramming event, where you're taking something away from one metabolic pathway and making something else, as opposed to ramping, just ramping stuff up. This is true reprogramming, we feel. And there is the structure, and the bottom line is, evidence from my lab and many labs now suggests that itaconate is a potent immunomodulatory metabolite. And it really is this skewing, as I say, away from crowds is what this is all about. Now, just before I get into it, um, there have been a literature on itaconate as an antibacterial agent. And this is back maybe in the 70s and 80s. People got evidence for this initially that itaconate can kill bacteria. And this seems to be true. So one reason the macrophage makes it is to have this bacterial cyber property. And it blocks various pathways in bacteria. It blocks, blocks like shunt in the middle there. Is common in Staph aureus and TB, for instance. So if you block that in bacteria, you will see an antibacterial effect. And there have been this literature bouncing around. And this is a nice review written by Carson Hiller, Alessandro Michelucci. They're very important because they were the people who told us that IRG1 is the enzyme that makes itaconate. Its function wasn't known until Carson and his team showed it was the enzyme that makes itaconate, a very important starting point in many ways for this immunomodulatory field to do with itaconate. And then um, I want to highlight this paper. I, I, I told you this last Friday at another webinar. Uh, Alice Prince's lab and Sebastian Raquel made a lovely paper about to come out and sell metabolism. So I'm giving them a plug here. I recommend you read this paper. I did the news and views on it. That's why this diagram is here because we made it for the news. And it's literally only last Friday. And what's very interesting is certain bacteria, of course, itaconates can target them. But guess what? 
they evolve away around this. And pseudomonas and cystic fibrosis, that's the main focus of Monas's paper. It, it drives iditanate production just like LPS would do, and has LPS anyway. And that now is actually feeding the bacteria. So pseudomonas has evolved a way to digest iditanate and use it as a carbon source. It also lowers LPS on its surface. It's going to be anti inflammatory, as you can see. Meanwhile, Alice's group also shows, just like we were, could repeat our stuff, I kind of block IL-1. And that, as I'll, as I'll show you in a minute, is a very important part of what this uh, metabolite does. And again, that will be anti-inflammatory. And then the biofilm is promoted in this process, and you get things like alginates forming, and they're able to drive IRT-1 to promote iditanate production. It's a great example, I think, of a host pathogen interaction. And it further emphasizes the importance of iditanate. Because this bacteria goes to the trouble of driving iditanate production by macrophages, which then it uses as a fuel source and can circumvent any of these sort of, um, you know, antibacterial effects. It's evolved a mechanism around that to its advantage, and you get bacterial growth. And I recommend people read that paper. That's a really good example, as I say, of this uh, metabolic world and immunometabolic change having a direct role on pathogenesis and in the case of cystic fibrosis. You'll see lovely data analysis paper connected with pseudomonas in that regard. Now, also, the times we live in, there is evidence that the kind of antiviral. And first of all, we showed it could block type 1 interferon production, and that could have various consequences for viruses, of course. There was a lovely paper in Immunity back in 2019, how to kind of can block Zika virus replication, and they could protect mice with Zika infection by using Iticonate. They use one of our derivatives, 4 octal Iticonate, could stop mice dying from Zika virus because it blocks the neurodegeneration, actually, and the inflammatory events that are happening there. There's also evidence of it affecting flu replication in cells. And that means now it could have a role in SARS-CoV-2 because it's an RNA virus. And at the moment, my lab is now testing this, to be honest, with collaborators in, uh, in Holland and Belgium to see if Iticonate has antiviral effects. And then finally, there's one paper showing boosting VSV. So therefore, there's a role for Iticonate, we think, in viral infections now. And that's just the beginning. These papers are very recent, and we'd like to know more about what Iticonate does to viruses. And it's one to watch, especially in the context of SARS-CoV-2. Now, remember, overall, our evidence is that it's anti-inflammatory. And it does this through multiple pathways, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, so you might have a double whammy here, where it might be antiviral and anti-inflammatory. Wouldn't that be a wonderful property to use during viral infections, including not just SARS-CoV-2, but also influenza, potentially. And maybe you'll see an antibacterial effect and an anti-inflammatory effect in, in the context of bacterial infections. So I think it becomes more and more interesting in terms of host defense, I guess, and, and um, a role in limiting viral and bacterial the sepsis will be the ultimate thing we're talking about, I guess. And in fact, um, here's a slide that shows you all these different things viruses do manipulate metabolism. There's loads of examples of viruses driving glycolysis for them. So it's an area that's really reawakening that is a recent review, just to highlight it. All the blue ones are different viral codings that, that impact on metabolism. So clearly viruses are interfacing with these metabolic pathways. And then with the pseudomonas example, saw bacteria, in that case, driving hydroconate as a fuel source. So it's one to watch this area. Now, I don't get into it initially because we've seen in a metabolomic screen a big boost of iticonate production in human macrophages given LPS. Now, look at the size of that. It's six like order, six like order induction of iticonate here. You see a lot more in mice, actually. Mouse cells are even more responsive in terms of iticonate synthesis. But it stands out as a metabolite being driven in the inflammatory macrophage, and LPS is a good way to drive the inflammatory macrophage. And we've seen this. We didn't have any clue what it did. We just saw the elevation. And then a very important paper by Max Artemis came out, and I met Max at the time, and he said to me, oh, we saw the conate as well, but guess what? It blocks SDH. That's my dear daughter. That had been shown way back in the 1950s that I took the block SDH. But Max had done this based on our work on succinate, where succinate gets metabolized by SCA to get reverse electron transport, driving rods on the left-hand side there, and that drives HIF. Max was showing this is a negative feedback regulator of that process. So it kind of builds up in the macrophage, inhibits SDH to stop succinate from driving rods, is the overall idea. And there were two more papers, Tecla Cordes, another key um, pioneering investigator, and a lab led by, uh, involving uh, in the Fafford Journal by Nemeth and colleagues, they showed SDH was being blocked by iconic. And that's one reason it goes up. And then we showed there was more to it than that. It could also drive NRF2 at the top of the picture there. It does that by reacting with T-cysteine, T-C1, back that in a minute. 
and then Max himself had another paper out the kind of driving ATF3. And that was suppress ICAP of the Zeta and have an anti inflammatory effect there. So suddenly, in the space of about a year, a lot more functions were assigned to this metabolite coming off the cycle. The net output was anti inflammatory. And the meanwhile, succinate in the last sort of two years, I guess, now has got even more interesting because over the mitochondria, you've seen the top right hand side there. There's a receptor on macrophages, there's a receptor on tough cells, which is YL22, for instance, that was Richard Fitchlock's work. So suddenly, these Krebs cycle intermediates have interesting other properties outside their traditional role in Krebs cycle. And that's where this, as earlier, the excitement began to emerge. So it kind of has several different functions and has these anti-inflammatory effects. And just briefly on the, um, oh, by the way, a bit of seahorse data, beg your pardon, of course, in our paper, we showed a very good effect on respiration. Now, again, this is consistent with, uh, with the effect on SDH. It's not a great SDH inhibitor in our hands. You need a lot of, uh, to kind of see that. And here we are comparing to malinase. Again, using the oxygen consumption rate, using a seahorse of animalism where that did these seahorse analyses, it clearly can impact on respiration through effects on STA. So that is part of its mechanism. We don't think it's the main part, but it certainly is part of the picture. Malinate is the classic STA, and everybody you see in the blue there, much more potent than attacking like blocking that oxygen consumption rate. So that's part of our data based on seahorse analysis. Now, some of the evidence then that's anti inflammatory, we gave it to mice. And lo and behold, it protects against LPS lethality, a very clear systemic anti-inflammatory response. We can't protect them fully because it's not a drug. You know, we just gave it as a, as a tool compound. But there you can see delaying LPS lethality by giving mice hydroconate. We knocked, it, knocked down the enzyme IRG1 in human macrophages, and that would make hydroconate, of course. And lo and behold, you boost IL-1 because you're losing an anti-inflammatory process. Very nice data in humans, which is important. And then Mihai Natea and colleagues had a very nice paper last year as well, uh, showing that itaconic was part of immunoparalysis and sepsis. And as, as many of you may know, LPS will drive a sort of an immunoparalysis response. You get suppression and tolerance, and itaconate through SDH inhibition is a key part of that process. And these might be the glucan, which can suppress this uh, immunoparalysis, suppress IRG1. And that was Mihai's paper again, speaking to itaconate having this anti inflammatory immunomodulatory effect, and that kind of added to some of the work that we had done, which is quite nice. Now, our work on NRF2, and I'm going to mention it very briefly because we probably just a year and a half ago now, we got to like Dylan and Ryan in my lab, a graduate student, then about a middle, we're, we're doing all this work. Uh, Dylan said to me, it looks like fumarase. It does indeed, chemically, you can see that. And fumarase can react with cysteines on proteins. It's called succination, that reaction, just to confuse us. And we wondered then, would Iticonate also be cysteine reactive? based on its chemistry, and lo and behold, it is. And the first thing we found was key one, and that will drive NRF2, which drives anti-inflammatory, anti-oxygen expression. We've at least 50 proteins undergo this modification. Now, LDH is there, interestingly. So you'll suppress glycolysis by modifying LDH. We've got a big interest in that. And XNA1, and the von prostaglandin, that gets modified as well. So it turns out a whole set of proteins are modified by itaconase. And then a paper last year by Chi Wang and colleagues, the Nature Camarazzi, they had another method to measure this. They'd seen our paper, and they came up with a second method to measure cysteine modification. It's a glycosylation-based method. And just like us, they saw the H modification. About half the things we'd seen, they saw as well, which is always re reassuring, because they could confirm our work. But they honed in on glycolysis. So aldolase A was inhibited, and GAT-DH. The and these were undergoing cysteine modification as well. So that brought glycolysis firmly into the picture. And it turns out dimethyl fumarate also targets GAP-DH, as does 4 octal That's when, uh, 4 oi is one of our derivatives. And another paper has shown GAP-DH modification. So in many ways, GAP-DH became a focus, because that seems to be especially reactive. And maybe some of the potency of dimethyl fumarate in autoimmunity, because it's used for MS, remember, might be through mimicking itaconate. In some ways, it might be just sort of a, a, a chemical that can mimic a natural process. There's a possibility that people got lucky, basically, with DMS, and showed it was doing the same thing as attacking So suddenly the cysteine reactivity has become a big focus. And my lab now is firmly following up on many of these modifications. By the way, we'd seen the same effect in a way. We looked at IRG1 knockout macrophages, um, and they can't make any attacking And it turns out all these enzymes in glycolysis were boosted in those macrophages. So again, there was a tie-in the glycolysis here, we'd seen itaconate limiting glycolysis in various ways, not just through inhibiting a, uh, these are metabolites, by the way, these are uh, glycolysis intermediates being suppressed here. 
So this, this we think is consistent with uh, Hughes' work on modifying enzymes in glycolysis and suppressing glycolysis. The amount of RG1, less itaconate, all these metabolites go up. So what this means is glycolysis now joins the picture. So we've got, we've got SCH inhibition down the bottom. We've NRF2 being driven by itaconate. We've ATF3, which suppresses certain cytokines. And now we see suppression of Warburg, if you like, from itaconate. And in my view, it's a very interesting crosstalk with mitochondria. Because remember, the mitochondria make the attacanase and that blocks glycolysis. And therefore, you're limiting the flux through glycolysis, and that will have an anti inflammatory effect overall. So, again, the picture emerges this is a very important, potentially anti inflammatory metabolite doing all these different things. Now, finally, I want to give you the new stuff. And we have evidence going back to my very start in a form, very symmetrically, that this metabolite can affect on a lot of these now, we got the idea here initially because of the role of ROS in driving on lp 3 And because we've seen NRS2 as a key thing that was being driven by itaconate, many antioxidant pathways get triggered by NRF2, and would they suppress ROS and maybe then limit NRF, NLRP3? That was our initial supposition. It turns out this is not the case. We've evidence now it directly modifies NLRP3, as you'll see in a minute. But first of all, you know, we began doing standard experiments. Um, this is your bog standard inflammasome assay of metal RP3. You drive it with ATP. Uh, just before you add the ATP, you give it a deconate, and it suppresses IL-1 production very nicely. There's my gerasin driving the inflammasome. Again, articonate can block that. IL-18, these are IL-1 measurements, by the way. We also measured IL-18. That was very clearly suppressed as well. It seemed especially sensitive. So here we see inhibition of NLRP3, because remember, we're adding it now before you add the NLRP3 activator. And lo and behold, uh, the outputs are being inhibited. Equally, pyroptosis is inhibited here. You'll see the ATP and nigeris and itaconate can block pyroptosis as a read into that pathway. We also measured um, inflammasome assembly. ASK is the key platform that forms the inflammasome. And you can measure these massive ASK oligomers. There's a cross linking gel on the right. Itaconate can block assembly of them. There's quantification of ASK specs. And again, itaconate's inhibitory there. Now, of course, at this stage, it could have been classified as one. Say, or some other common component because you know we were just using these functional readouts. So we measured two other inflammasomes, NLRC4 on the left, no inhibition, AIM2 on the right, no inhibition again. So this suggested specificity towards NLRP3. We took patient samples just to get more data. These are CAPS patients, they've got a mutation in NLRP3 that activates the protein. Ex vivo, they make loads of IL1, and lo and behold. There's itaconate block in that IL-1. So again, evidence from a patient system where you have overactivation of NLRP3 being inhibited. That was quite neat to back up our data on the macrophages. Another piece of evidence, you can reconstitute the inflammasome in 293. So it's overexpress all the components. And then the, uh, the fourth histobar in there, the big one, that's the inflammasome being activated by overexpression. And again, if you overexpress IG1, which will make itaconate, you can block that signal. So again, in reconstitution, I say now, itaconate inhibitory, which is good to see. And then we got knockouts, of course. The IG1 knockout, guess what? They make a lot more IL-1 because you've lost this inhibitory effect. And the black histobar is, is um, IL-1 being made in response to inflammatory activation. You boost it now in the IG1 knockout. And you get boost in IL-1 and P20 in the western, the last line there. You can see boosting of those signals. Uh, again, evidence that the inflammasome is being triggered if you lose RG1 because you're losing this inhibitory signal. No effect on AM2 in those knockouts, it's the important control. AM2 was normal in the RG1 knockout. And then, of course, we wonder what the mechanism was. We took some NRF2 knockouts, and lo and behold, we could sit in here in the block histobar there, attacking a block and IL1 in the NRF2 knockout. So this wasn't NRF2 dependent, which, of course, was our first idea. And that was a bit disappointing, but still, it got even more interesting because, of course, uh, you know, there's the answer no to that question. The question became, could it be modifying the 15 modification component in the NLRP3 inflammasome? The two candidates, NLRP3 of 12 and MEX7, which is a specific organizer for the NLRP3 inflammasome. And to cut a long story short, uh, we copied uh, other papers. Parthenolide is a compound shown to modify cysteine. Another compound called aridonin. There's a lot of papers out on and the LRP3, that modifies the key cysteine as well. So we knew there was cysteine reactivity in the NLRP3 system. And then we've done mass spec and we've identified cysteine 548 as being modified by a in the NLRP3 inflammasome. 
Now, we're still studying this in detail to make sure this is the one that's being modified for functional consequences, but we think the mechanism involves cysteine modification. And then finally, whatever the mechanism might be, that's our suspicion, we add an LRP3 to the mix. And here we see yet more evidence about the time is a really important anti-inflammatory because, as I said earlier, NLRP3 is driving many inflammatory situations, and lo and behold, evolution has built in a metabolite to limit that pathway and have an anti-inflammatory effect. So I think this finding is important because it certainly adds weight to NLRP3 as a key inflammatory pathway, but more importantly, we didn't need it already, uh, attacking an, an, an immune metabolism now, metabolic reprogramming, can impact on that very important metabolic pathway. So finally now, just to finish on one more thing, um, and this is very recent data. Now, my life has been closed, as many of us have been, and it's so hard to get back to this. We want to work on this, because this is a very exciting piece of data. Uh, we, we, we looked at human samples again, to look at the human is extremely important for us. What inspired us was, um, last summer, I had the honor to referee a paper on the structure of the IOG1 decarboxylase enzyme. Lovely structural paper. It's a decarboxylase. And in that paper, they report different variants in IOG1. Now, these were in the database. We kind of missed this, that there were different variants of IOG1. The reason why this paper highlights them was some of them are in the active side of the enzyme, and they could use information on the mechanism of catalysis to look at these different variants. And one of them, the top one here, the phthalogene series variant is three times more active, that's the rate of the enzyme there, than the wild type, if you like. The blue one is the wild type. An intermediate was also reported. And that was interesting. But then, look at this. You'll see here different populations. The African population have a, almost 20% frequency of this activating form of IRG1. And that got my attention. Oh, there's, 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 there's a type of IRG1 that's much more active in certain ethnic groups. And then I wondered, if you took cells from these different ethnic groups, would you see a difference in cytokines? And Mihai Natea, going back to our great collaborator Mihai, and Vaino Dapalia, I knew Mihai and, and, and Vina had done um, studies on African populations with adjuvants. They've got a big interest in vaccination, malaria and TB, for instance. And they had challenged African samples and measured cytokines from those samples, and a genotype them. It's a real sort of tour de force, me how it was almost whole genome sequencing of these populations. And I asked them, without telling them what the reason was, that variant in IG1, the activating variant, could he find an association of cytokine production in those samples? Because he measured cytokines as well. And look what he sent back. Less IL-5 in the middle now is the variant that's more active. Less IL-5 on the right, and less gamma in the middle. Those two cytokines put it as being statistically significant. Now, what this means is, we think, and that's just the start of this, that variant in IG1 is making more attack and eight, and lo and behold, human subjects, when you challenge them, are making less gamma and less IL-5 in response to an inflammatory stimulus. And of course, we think it's because they're making more attack and eight. This may have evolved to protect against parasitic infections, possibly, you never know. In other words, you're making more attack and eight to block the unwanted overproduction of certain cytokines and the kind of some infection of some possible reason. But for us, it really validates this pathway in humans. Because here we see people with a variant that makes a lot of hypochondrite making less inflammatory cytokines when you challenge them. And that suggests indeed that hypochondrite is anti inflammatory in humans. And we're working on this more and more, of course. But that's a very interesting last little bit of uh, human data there. For the summarize, what does that leave us? Well, first of all, as I mentioned, NLRP3 inhibitors, very interested in those. NLRP3 sensing metabolic disturbance in different disease states. Will they make it? Let's hope. We don't know. We, we have, uh, my company, Emphazom, has made two of them. Uh, several. We've got other companies are now uh, working on the back of our paper. Actually, our paper reveals NLRP3 is druggable. And now, lots of inhibitors are in development. Let's see what happens. Secondly, immunometabolism, new frontier. We're also excited about this data coming out. Now, remember, if you block that pathway, you might see a therapeutic effect. We know it works already, methotrexate in humans anyway. So is metformin. They're metabolic reprogrammers, and they have anti-inflammatory effects. So we, the, the clues there, and now newer targets, PKM2 gave you that story, and hydrocarnase NRF2, like Travis NRF3. So in other words, we might be able to now explore those two processes further as a potential anti-inflammatory strategy to break that ceiling. That's on my very first slide, maybe targeting these things will allow us to breach the uh, the efficacy ceiling and see better therapies for all these diseases. And that, that's the next phase, in many ways, of the translational part of this work. Meanwhile, 
lots more basic science to be done around these things as well. I'm sure you all agree. I'll finish on that. Thank the lab, thanks, Dylan and Ivana, uh, who did lots of work on Atomic originally in my lab, of course. And then the more recent stuff, there's Stefano Angari at the back there. He did the work on PKM2. Big thanks to him. Alex Hoofman, another graduate student, done fantastic work on NLRP3. All that data I showed with his. Uh, and then finally, our collaborators, Mike Murphy in Cambridge, Christian Fraser, and their groups, very important in many different ways for ideas and their mitochondrial metabolomic gurus. There's Mihai and Vinod for the work of the human sample. Richard Harty makes a reagent and is a very important chemist to advise us. Roman Fisher helps with some of the system modification. Some of this is on GSK on sabbatical that we I want to thank her. The collaboration that we have there has been very helpful in many ways. EOC, welcome. FFI and GSK are our funders. And thank you all very much for listening. Great. Thank you, Luke. Appreciate it very much. Uh, we have a lot of questions, as you might have uh, anticipated. So let's get see, started and see how many we can get through. Um, as I'm sure you're well aware, many people are trying to separate good from bad inflammation. Almost every age-related disorder has both qualities, potentially, uh, and maybe it's just an equilibrium. So the question is, is it really possible to se separate good from bad, or is it more a question of equilibrium? And the follow-up to that is, is there a potential weakness if we intervene and dampen inflammation, especially for a chronic process? Yeah, I mean, this is always in our minds. That's a, a really good question, obviously. Enough. Now, what you're trying to do is, yeah, correct the homeostatic imbalance in a way, because the inflammatory process is absolutely good for us. It can repair tissues and all kinds of things. So you're trying to get it back down to that state in many ways, and then modulate it, I suppose. And that, that's what the best anti-inflammatories do anyway. You don't want to shut it off, because then you're going to get onto war effects. So so the trick here is to, is to sort of uh, limit it, I guess. And metabolism is another option, and there's really good papers showing that you can target certain metabolic processes in, say, T cells or macrophages and see a therapeutic effect without any un unwanted effects, because the big worry would be other cell types might be affected. It looks as if the inflammatory cells have a special appetite, they call kind of an addiction sometimes for these things. So we do think it's possible to, to, to modulate it without turning it off, really, is the, is the uh, answer to the first part. Uh, what, was the, oh, the chronic, what was the second question, David? I've forgotten what the second question was. Yeah. If you're successful in dampening inflammation, especially in a chronic disease, are there any weaknesses you feel to that? Will there be a consequence, yeah. some stability, or go ahead? Yeah, it's in your mind. I mean, you might affect repair processes, which you wouldn't want necessarily. So you look out for these things, and then you might affect host defense. I mean, that's a really concern, by the way. But again, we think that there's therapeutic windows here to avoid those unwanted effects. Got it. Got it. Um, so we have a couple of uh, peak. PKM2, actually quite a few PKM2 questions, uh, and, and kind of two parts. Why don't we do the first part, which is, um, what do you know about the regulation of the dimer versus the tetramer? Is there anything known about how that's regulated, how that occurs uh, in terms of those two species? Yeah, yeah, and, and some of the earlier work on this, of course, was showing out of steric regulation, the things like phosphofructose, um, phosphate, for instance, serine, can affect it. So there's a lot of information on where those metabolites bind and how they alter the oligomerization state. Uh, there's also stuff on phosphorylation. I mean, it's still a bit of a mystery, actually, how you force the dimer. We know you need tyrosine phosphorylation, tyrosine 105. Some of the gold factor oncogenic pathways will come out that and then drive the dimer. And there's a, as I just mentioned, there's a serine phosphorylation as well. So it's been a bit neglected that. But that's a really interesting area to think about, to be honest, precisely how you're driving that dimer versus the tetramer. Because that would give you other options then to limit it. That's a good question. It's slightly, slightly unanswered at the moment. So part two of that question is, um, in terms of the um, uh, PKM2 tetramerization, um, clearly showed the down regulation of HIF and, and some other things, but you, well, have you identified any um, genes that are upregulated that support or relate to the Treg development? That's the, still the mystery. So, so we know you do thiol 10 for instance, in a macrophage very clearly. And it's a fascinating thing that in a way, if you think about it for a second, you're given those max LPS. That's a powerful inflammatory stimulus. You drive the tetramer, and they make buckets of IL-10 instead. I mean, that LPS will drive some IL-10, but you're shifting it towards that state. We still don't know the mechanism. We think it's obviously epigenetic in some way, we think. And then you're altering flux through glycolysis, maybe, or changing some of the uh, epigenetic regulators, maybe. So we've tried hard. We've been a bit of time trying to measure that. It's very hard. In my lab, anyway, we, can't, we have trouble measuring. 
his style changes in this way, in a quantitative way. So, so it's a bit of an unanswered question. We know what happens. Um, our suspicion is that it's Same with FOXP3. Again, we're wondering, is that some sort of epigenetic alteration to boost its expression? We'd love to know more about that. It's a really interesting question. So this is kind of a neat one. Um, in regards to uh, uh, studying smooth muscle cells um, <clears throat> involved in cardiovascular um, uh, disorders, and um, they now know, or at least the group says that they found that smooth muscle cells can transdifferentiate into macrophage-like cells. I don't know if you've heard about that. Uh, and then the question would be, do you think smooth muscle cells would have an immunometabolism or a, a balance that um, might be involved in disease progression, these cardiovascular disorders through this kind of connecting to the smooth muscle uh, component? Absolutely. That, no, yeah, no, that, that's a... That, that's a really left to me. That's a left fielder, but it's really good actually. Yeah, because I was I was vaguely familiar with that. Yeah, you get a differentiation process, I think, which can drive macrophage uh, production, I guess. But that's a really good one to think about. And you'd wonder now if, if that differentiation process from a smooth muscle cell into a more macrophage type cell, you see metabolic changes. It'd be great to do RNA seq there, for instance. Maybe people have done it. Uh, but to look at metabolic pathways in that differentiation event. Uh, meanwhile, absolutely, the smooth. I mean, as I said earlier. There's been over the last, say, four or five years, people are mapping metabolic change in endothelial cells, for instance. Why not smooth muscle cells? I'm sure there's stuff out there on, on, on certain activating, you know, profiles or whatever it might be, seeing differences in, in, in metabolic processes there as well. You'd love to know if there's orthofluxinase, for instance, in smooth muscle cell function. That's well worth considering. It kind of reminds me a lot of times, as I'm sure you do, when you speak to uh, uh, audiences that aren't very familiar with metabolism, like you said, they learned it and forgot it, which was me too and everyone else. Um, I, I usually start by saying, you know, glycolysis is a great way to move between equilibriums. It can respond to very discontinuous signals and can be very, you know, robust. And whereas mitochondria in general tends to be the home static, you know, when things are yeah. you know, doing what they should be doing and, and a good equilibrium. And it's funny because no matter what data you see, including the data you show today, that seems to really hold true, right? And and is this really this balance? You know, it's kind of like um, you showed Nav's book, um, which is a great one. I, I completely agree with you. Uh, and, you know, it comes from kind of Craig Thompson, you know, heavy influence. You know, is it really all just about nutrient sensing? And no matter whether you're the pathogen or the immune system, it's really about creating a, a situation where you can most effectively sense nutrients. You know, I, I almost wonder, Absolutely. and that's why this, yeah. this thing between smooth muscle Great. and uh, macrophage. Great point, David. I mean, I mean, I've always felt that the first thing that cell senses is the nutrient environment, clearly. You can see how evolution then would, you know, build that sensing into other things. And, and initially, we would have thought, oh, you're, you're sensing nutrients just to get them as a source of nutrients, clearly. But clearly, they can be signals, you know. And they can drive certain gene expression profiles to respond to some inherent environmental danger. And that, that's where the shift has been. And that's, this has been suggested for a good few years, by the way. It's not as if it's a new idea. I mean, mTOR right. daddy them all, let's face it. mTOR sense amino acids. Yeah. A AMPK, they've been there for quite a while, haven't they? We've, we've understood a lot about them. So, But you're right. There's something, yeah. there's something interesting in terms of evolution there for definite. And why is it the mitochondria? Clearly, a lot of metabolic activity happens there. So you're leveraging that, I guess. Uh, you leverage the yeah. DNA, the ROS. So, so the fact that and the right. mitochondria are so sensitive, the membrane potential is everything, as we all know. So, so the, the ROS. So, so the fact that and the right. mitochondria are so sensitive, the membrane potential is everything, as we all know. So, so there's a lot, a lot of interesting sensing going on here in different contexts that can become pathological. Right. The idea, of course, you see. But I, I agree with you about the mitochondria. It might be in the ultimate symbiosis that occurred, you know, for, for whatever yeah. creature we yeah. are today. Uh, but anyways, uh, let's see if we can get to one or two more questions. Uh, I, I, we won't get to them all by any stretch, but let's, let's try to get to a couple more. Um, I really like this one. Um, what about changes in mitochondrial dynamics, right? Uh, fusion and fission. Uh, and, and this one's associated with isoconate, but, you know, you, you could apply that to almost any of the things that you were talked about today. Yeah, well, as, as we know, there's been wonderful papers, Erica Pierce's lab, and, you know, there's been a few really interesting papers on fusion fission, hasn't there? And clearly, uh, the, the, the fizzed state is bad, the fused state is good, the fused mitochondria, as everybody knows, they, they respire better, there'd be less succinate accumulating there. So that, that interplay between those two states is really important. And then, again, the small molecules out there that can regulate that, that dynamically, you see. So I think there's therapeutic potential in that. 
to regulate that. If you can promote fusion, that's got to be a good thing. Mitophagy comes into it, of course, because that, that, that will deal with the damage of mitochondria, get rid of them. And again, the, the, the fizzed mitochondria are more prone to autophagy from all the usual mechanistic elements there. So I think that that's an area that, that that's really fascinating. And, and, and again, I think a lot of questions that are well worth pursuing in, in, in regards to that, that state. Right. Well, we're, we're after the hour, Luke, and I think they turn off the lights eventually. So again, um, I would very much thank you. I know the audience very much appreciative for your uh, talk today, both, um, you know, the high level view of things all the way down to the details. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure. And I'd like to thank the audience for tuning in uh, today and, uh, hope, and it seems that everybody enjoyed it. So until next time, uh, again, thank you so much, Luke. Great. No problem. Happy to help.